Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, today I thought, let me share my screen. Today I thought that I would um, give more of a standard research talk and tell you about some of the ongoing projects in my lab. And once again, please do feel free to interrupt if you have any questions. All right, so um, today I'm going to talk to you about a couple projects in our lab focused on understanding short-term evolution using a wild population that's been pedigreed, so a wild population of Florida scrub jays. Um, so as you all may already know, um, evolution can occur in just a small number of generations. There are now many beautiful examples of rapid phenotypic change in nature. So here I'm showing you kind of two textbook examples of rapid adaptation. One is the evolution of melanism and peppered moths in the UK. And the other is the evolution of beak size and shape in Darwin's finches. So Rapid phenotypic evolution has also been known um, and shown to occur in response to anthropogenic changes, such as hunting-induced evolution of um, decreased body size in bighorn sheep. So in some of these cases, such as the peppered moths example, we know the genes underlying the rapid phenotypic change. But for the most part, I would argue that we still lack a deep understanding of how short-term evolutionary change occurs at the level of the genome. Um, and understanding the genomic basis of short-term evolutionary change is really essential for assessing the adaptive potential of natural populations and predicting evolutionary trajectories. Finally, I'd like to remind you um, that the most basic definition of evolution is in fact the change in allele frequencies in a population over time. So as you've learned, during the school over the past two weeks, there are a number of different processes that can change allele frequencies over time. So mutation can generate new variation, gene flow in and out of the population or natural selection can either increase or decrease levels of genetic variation and genetic drift typically acts to remove genetic variation from a population over time. So understanding the evolutionary processes that govern allele frequency change has been the central focus of the field of population genetics. And for most population genetic studies, traditionally, at least what we do is we go out to our population of interest, we sample a couple, as many individuals as we can, we genotype them, and then we use computational methods um, to make inferences about the evolutionary processes that generated the patterns of genetic variation we observe. If we're lucky, we may have multiple temporal samples from the same population. Um, so we can then look at patterns of genetic variation over time. And this gives us a little bit more power to make inferences. Um, but as I mentioned in my first lecture, what is really happening in natural populations is that different individuals move around the landscape, some die, some survive, and some reproduce. And allele frequencies change because these different individuals have different genetic contributions to the population over time. All of these individual level processes are encapsulated in what's called the population pedigree, um, or the set of relationships among all individuals in a population over time. So um, assuming kind of a sexually reproducing organism for every natural population. I guess this is true for um, others too, but there's one true underlying pedigree um, under for every population. And this pedigree allows us to directly observe the evolutionary processes that change allele frequencies in real time. So it's non-trivial to be able to uh, collect data that allows you to construct a population pedigree. Um, but the availability of these data are increasing um, thanks to a, a number of different factors. So one, there's a heightened awareness of the value of these longitudinal data sets. Um, there have been development of more and more tools that can accurately construct pedigrees from genetic data. And it's also kind of a natural consequence of the ever increasing sample sizes 
um, of studies such as like human genomic studies and other studies of natural populations. Right now though, the most complete population pedigrees come from a handful of like long-term individual based studies that have accumulated complete life histories for hundreds or thousands of individuals across decades. And I'm showing you kind of examples here. So there's the soy sheep, red deer, um, a baboon population and several different bird populations in a red squirrel um, study and also humans. Uh, while we've gained substantial insights in many fields from such studies, um, now more and more folks are adding genomics uh, to these long-term demographic data sets, which then enables us to tackle a whole new layer of evolutionary questions. So my lab um, develops geno genomic resources and computational tools that combine evolutionary genomics and pedigree data from these multi-decade long-term demographic studies in order to address fundamental questions about short-term evolution in natural populations. So kind of major themes in the lab are to characterize the evolutionary processes shaping genetic variations of space and time, and to link genetic variation to variation in individual phenotypes, fitness, and eventually population dynamics. Um, the primary study organism for our work is the Florida scrub jay, this beautiful blue bird. Um, the Florida scrub jay is a cooperative breeder, uh, which means offspring delay dispersal and stay around at home to help their parents raise future offspring. It's restricted to this very unique xeric oak scrub habitat um, that has largely disappeared due to human mediated habitat destruction and fire suppression. So the number of Jays has declined by more than 97% during the past century, and by nearly 50% in the past 20 years. So much of our work has conservation implications, although I won't be talking about any of those projects today. There are a few aspects about its biology that makes this species particularly amenable to long-term studies. So Florida scrub jays are non-migratory and highly philopatric, which allows us to follow the same individuals over time. Um, they have fairly short dispersal distances so offspring don't move very far so we can follow kind of the offspring of individuals over time. Um, they're socially and mostly genetically monogamous, uh, which means we can construct fairly accurate pedigrees from field observations alone. Um, they're also very easy to work with uh, in the field because they are addicted to peanuts. Um, so we can easily census birds uh, just by calling them in um, and because they think we'll give them peanuts. Um, I should clarify that these photos are fairly unusual photos. It's not standard field protocol. We typically try to interact with these birds as little as possible, but there are like one or two birds in the population who um, are not afraid of humans at all. So a population of Florida scrub jays has been very closely monitored at Archbold Biological Station since 1969. Um, there's an extensive amount of field work that goes into the study. So the entire population is censused once a month, um, which gives us accurate information on individual lifespans. Every nest of every family group is found and closely monitored. So we know how many eggs are laid, we know how many of those eggs hatch and how long the nestings live. So in other words, we have the ability to accurately measure annual and lifetime reproductive success for almost all the individuals in our population over time. We have direct measures of dispersal distances for hundreds of um, individuals, which is nice. And then starting in 1999, blood samples have been taken from every nestling and immigrant recruited into the population. Uh, which has resulted in this kind of huge archive of DNA samples for everyone in our population going back for decades. All the scrub jay territories on our study site are mapped every year, um, and we also collect data on habitat composition, ooh, excuse me, food availability, uh, climate, and fire history. So over the kind of past half century, what this means is we've accumulated complete life history and phenotypic data for more than 10,000 individuals on a 14 generation pedigree. 
So this kind of mass of dots and um, lines here is our population pedigree. Um, you're not really supposed to gain any information from it besides the fact that we have a lot of data and a fairly kind of complete and connected pedigree. Um, finally, we also have fairly comprehensive genotyping of our population over time. So as a graduate student, I developed substantial genomic resources for the Florida scrub jay um, and designed custom Illumina isolate bee chips to genotype about 3,800 individuals at 12,000 steps across the genome. The figure on the bottom shows you the total number of birds in our population over time in gray and the number who are genotyped in blue. So as you can see, we genotype nearly every individual in our population um, for more than a decade. And this wealth of genomic, environmental, demographic, and phenotypic data from a population with a known genealogy or known population pedigree provides a really powerful framework for directly testing core predictions of evolutionary biology and nature. So today I thought I would tell you um, about two stories. Um, so one, we'll talk about kind of some of the progress we've made in understanding the evolutionary processes that govern short-term frequency dynamics in our population, and then um, focus a little bit more on selection and talk about this kind of fine scale, the section of selection on different stages of the life cycle within a generation. So from our pedigree, uh, we know there's fairly high variation in lifetime reproductive success in our population. Um, here, I'm uh, defining lifetime reproductive success as the total number of nestlings produced over an individual's lifetime. This histogram shows lifetime reproductive success for about a thousand breeding adults who are now completed their lifespan, so they're now dead. And as you can see, a lot of individuals actually don't leave any offspring, yet there's some individuals who produce, or very few individuals who produce more than 40 offspring during their lifetime. Since we have a nearly complete population pedigree, we can go beyond this commonly used kind of single generation proxy for fitness and actually identify all descendants of any given individual in our population. For example, here is a male who showed up in our population in 1992. He had four kids, um, none of his kids reproduced. So here is the pedigree of all of his descendants in our population over time, pretty small. You can contrast that with another male who showed up in our population the same exact year. Um, and as you can see, had much higher fitness. So he produced 41 offspring and a lot of his offspring produced offspring. And so his, uh, the pedigree of his descendants is um, dramatically larger. We can quantify um, an individual's contribution um, as their genealogical contribution to a population over time. So here I'm defining genealogical contribution as the proportion of the birth cohort in a given year um, that's related or descended, related to or descended from um, a given individual. So let's illustrate with our two example males. Um, our first male had kids in 1994 and in 1996, and then like those are all of his offspring. So he doesn't really contribute to the population after that. So his genealogical contribution to the population is mostly zero. Um, our more successful male um, has a substantially higher genetic contribution, as you can see here. Um, in fact, it's remarkable that about 25% of the birth cohort um, in our population in 2013 is descended from this one individual male. Um, one thing that's important to keep in mind, though, and something that I've kind of hinted at in previous lectures, is that there's a difference between genealogical contributions and genetic contributions for a particular individual. Um, and this is because not all genealogical descendants actually inherit genetic material from all of their ancestors. Um, so in this cartoon pedigree here, if we're interested in looking at the contribution of the female highlighted in green. All of the individuals represented by empty symbols here are genealogical descendants of this particular individual. Um, 
as you know, each parent contributes half its genome to the next generation in kind of large blocks that are randomly broken up by recombination. And so due to the vagaries and randomness of Mendelian transmission, by chance, some of um, her descendants will not actually inherit any genetic material from her. And so what this means is that um, there's going to be a difference between an individual's genealogical contributions and their genetic contributions. Um, so here uh, we can estimate both of these quantities from our pedigree. Here I'm showing um, genealogical contributions over time in blue. Uh, and now I'm adding on the expected genetic contributions in black. So remember that an individual's genealogical contribution is the proportion of the birth cohort um, descended from, uh, from that individual. And an individual's expected genetic contribution uh, refers to the expected proportion of alleles at a locus in the birth cohort um, that's inherited identical by descent from the focal individual. So from these top two, uh, graphs, you can see that the genealogical contribution of a particular individual is substantially higher than their expected genetic contribution. Um, and this provides kind of a nice empirical illustration for a substantial body of theory on the relationship between genetic and genealogical ancestry. Uh, yes, Deepa. Yeah, so is the genetic contribution an average of what you, I mean, is the expectation based on the known pedigree that you have, or is it um, I don't know, based on some theoretical model or something? Um, this, <clears throat> good question. The expected genetic contribution is based on the pedigree, um, but there is a little bit of noise. So this is kind of similar to estimating pedigree based um, inbreeding Related. coefficients. So we can mm. actually calculate there's like an analytical answer, right? So it's like one half to the power of the number of transmissions. Mm -hmm. um, and then we take the proportion to count number of alleles and then we take the proportion for the divide by the size of the first cohort. Mm -hmm. um, here, the black lines are, uh, the solid black line shows the mean ex expectation and the average, the gray bars show kind of the variance mm -hmm. around that expectation um, and we, Get that variance because the way we estimate expected genetic contributions is by simulating um, alleles down the pedigree. Mm -hmm. um, and we do it enough that we get the distribution of like expected okay. allele counts. So this pedigree. is not then taking into account actually using the, the genotyping data that you have for whatever loci. It's just yeah. saying this is what we expect on average to happen given the pedigree. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, so if we actually looked at, use the genetic data to look at realized, um, realized genetic contributions of individuals, like the black line should show the mean. Yeah, um, thanks. All right, um, we can also further disentangle expected genetic contributions of males versus females. Um, and we uh, started doing these analyses because we were early interested in understanding how sex bias demography uh, may affect patterns of genetic variation in our population over time. So to illustrate why this might be interesting, um, here's a pedigree of all descendants or one pair of individuals uh, who never mated with anyone else. So this is their pedigree, um, they share the exact same, they have the same descendants to our population over time. So they have the same genealogical contribution, um, which I'm showing here in blue. Um, the expected genetic contribution over time for a kind of given autosomal locus should be the same for males and females. Um, and here we're showing the expected autosomal genetic contribution for both individuals of this pair. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is that this pattern will actually be the same for the entire genome. And that's because there are particular chromosomes that have different transmission roles, right? So mitochondria are only maternally transmitted. Here, I'm gonna focus on sex chromosomes. Um, so in birds, females have ZW sex chromosomes and males are ZZ. 
Females transmit their Z chromosome to their sons and their W chromosome to their daughters, whereas males transmit one copy of their Z chromosome to all of their offspring. Right, so given these transmission rules, um, you would expect that the uh, expected genetic contributions of males and females on the Z chromosome should be very different, right? Because the male is passing on um, the Z to all of his offspring, whereas females only uh, pass on their Z to their sons. So we can um, show empirically that this is true. In the bottom right, I'm plotting the expected genetic contribution for a Z locus. Uh, for males in purple and females in green. And you can see here, you know, even though these two individuals um, have the exact same number of descendants, the males have a much higher expected genetic contribution to variation, genetic variation on the Z chromosome compared to the female. We can also use this approach to kind of ask questions about the importance of gene flow. So in particular, we were interested in quantifying how much incoming immigrants are contributing to levels of genetic variation in our population over time. Um, so here I'm showing you a graph showing the proportion of breeders that are immigrants in our population. It's declining um, significantly over time. And from previous work, we know that immigration is critical for maintaining levels of genetic variation in our population. Um, basically, we found that this decline in immigration over time um, is responsible for increasing uh, inbreeding coefficient, the average inbreeding coefficient of our birth cohort over time. And because of inbreeding depression, we're actually seeing a decrease in like juvenile survival and whatnot over time. So we know immigration is important, but can we actually estimate how much genetic variation these incoming immigrants are contributing? Um, so what we did was we estimated the kind of cumulative expected genetic contribution of all of our immigrants um, using kind of a similar approach as the results I showed before. Um, the black line here is showing the total expected genetic contribution of all immigrants appearing in our population after 1991 in black. So here, I, all of our simulations would start in 1990 um, and assume all birds in our population are, we just code them as residents in 1990. Um, and I'm showing you kind of the uh, genetic variation being brought in to the population since then. The stack colored lines are showing the added contribution of each cohort. Um, so you can see here that immigrants arriving since 1990 are expected to contribute 75% of the alleles present in our 2013 birth cohort. Um, so clearly they are contributing a lot to our population. We can separately consider contributions of male immigrants and female immigrants um, to try to assess the impact of female bias dispersal. So in Florida scrub jays, um, females disperse a lot further than males. And so a large proportion of our incoming immigrants are females. Um, here I'm showing you the expected genetic contribution of male immigrants in purple and female immigrants in green. You can see that female immigrants have a higher expected genetic contribution for any given autosomal locus, um, which makes sense because our incoming immigrants are primarily females. So, um, and so it makes sense um, that they are contributing more to the population. Um, there's no dramatic difference in reproductive success of male and female immigrants. Uh, however, right, as I said before, every, coming, every incoming male um, brings in two copies of the Z chromosome, and incoming females only bring in one copy of the Z. Males transmit a copy of the Z to all of their offspring, whereas females don't. Um, so we actually see the opposite pattern for Z-link markers, where um, males have a, male immigrants have a higher expected genetic contribution um, over time compared to our females um, up until like 2013, where it's starting, I think, to normalize finally. Uh, we're currently further exploring how sex bias demography can influence short-term evolutionary dynamics in our population. Yes, Deepa. Uh, maybe I missed something, but I'm 
wondering whether the expected genetic contribution is taking into account already the known mate, mating pairs that, that were whatever happening in the population? I, I guess it is, right? So it's not, I'm, I guess I'm curious if there's any, I forgot what you said about the mating behaviors that they have. I mean, is it multiple matings? Is it single pairs that sort of persist throughout? Um, yeah, maybe that that's actually a question that I should ask to be answered first. Um, yeah, yeah, they're monogamous, so they're socially and genetically monogamous, um, and they typically pair for life, although there are a few uh, instances where, uh, like using an anthropomorphic term, there are a few cases of divorce. Mm. Um, uh, very few, I think it's like, oh, my grandson calculated this. It's like less than 5% for sure. So for the most part, they pair for life um, and they will repair if their partner dies. Mm, mm. So when the immigrants come in, then I guess at what, at what point do they get pasted into the whole pedigree? Uh, so the yeah, immigrants meet um, with immigrants or because everybody else is already pair bonded or? Uh, so we know who the immigrants are because every individual in our population is banded. Mm -hmm. um, so when an unbanded bird shows up, we know it's an immigrant. Um, we can typically individuals don't stay on their home territory for the first year of life. So while they're juveniles mm -hmm. um, and after that, then they'll move. Um, and there's very, very little breeding dispersal. So once an individual is established as a breeder on a territory, they almost never move. Mm -hmm. um, they might, there are like some cases where if like a female loses her partner, she'll go and repair with a different male on a different territory, but for the most part, they don't move once they establish as breeders. So typically the immigrants coming into our population are, um, are not breeders. Some of them will show up and like help <laughs> at a territory for a year mm. uh, before establishing as a breeder. Others will show up and um, become a breeder on a territory. Okay. Okay. Then I, um, I guess then what I, what I was thinking about is whether this expected genetic contribution already includes any sort of, uh, differential pairings and so on, but I guess it, it, it won't make a difference because they're monogamous and they, they stay sort of together for the whole lifespan. So I guess the expected is going to be the same as observed for the most part. Like if you, measured the actual genetic contribution, the realized contribution that you were talking about before? Um, I think the realized contribution will differ a bit from the expected only because of just like randomness and then dealing in transmission. Mm -hmm. um, expected genetic yeah. contributions that we're showing here are estimated directly from the pedigree. Mm -hmm. um, so any, like all the social dynamics are part, um, and there's, there is like, they're almost completely genetically monogamous, but there's a very, very tiny rate of extra pair paternity. Um, and we've corrected our pedigree for the cases that we found at least. Oh, okay. Extra okay, cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, right. Okay. So Anyways, it's kind of fun to see these different dynamics for kind of different regions of the genome. So like sex-based inheritance and sex-biased, sex-biased inheritance and sex-biased um, demography are kind of interacting um, and sometimes in different ways. All right, so I've been talking a lot uh, about individual genetic contributions. Um, and I just wanted to remind you all that the reason we're so interested in them is because it's like variation in these individual genetic contribution, uh, individual genetic contributions over time that underlies allele frequency change. Now we did actually genotype a bunch of individuals. And so we do have the ability to look at, like look at allele frequencies directly. Um, and so we also spent some time trying to look at kind of the different evolutionary processes governing the trajectories of specific SNPs uh, in our population over time. So here I'm plotting the kind of allele frequency trajectories uh, for our 12,000 SNPs um, from 1999 to 2013. 
Uh, we do observe a few large allele frequency shifts over this fairly short 15 year time period. So colored lines highlight the 100 or so SNPs that change in frequency by more than 0.15 during this time period. And we wanted to try to understand what was driving some of these like large short-term allele frequency changes. Great. So here's one particular SNP um, that is increased in frequency by more than 0.25 in our population over just 15 years. Um, and typically, if you see kind of an allele frequency change like this, it's like a nice directional, large increase, fast change. Um, you would be really excited and think that maybe this is a SNP under selection, right? Because why it's increasing dramatically in our population. Um, so to test that, what we did was to use um, gene dropping simulations to model the neutral expectation for allele frequency changes in our population over time. Right, so the way this, these simulations work is we start with our population pedigree um, and the actual observed genotypes for all founder individuals. So in this case, uh, what this means is that we take the genotypes of all the individuals in our population in 1990 and also uh, the genotypes of any incoming immigrants, right? Because immigrants are um, founders and that we don't know who the parents are. Um, so we start with their uh, observed, actual observed genotype. Um, and then we simulate Mendelian transmission of alleles down the pedigree um, a million times. And this then generates kind of expected genotypes for, the, for every individual in our population over time. And we can use this to then um, calculate the expected distributions of allele frequencies um, under neutrality. So these gene dropping simulations on a population pedigree actually provide the most accurate null model um, in population genetics as they, uh, this approach kind of appropriately accounts for variation in population sizes over time. It also accounts for relatedness within the birth cohort. Um, and one other point that's important here too is that this approach also um, models the contribution of gene flow, right? Because we're kind of accounting for the genotypes of incoming immigrants. So what this means is that for each of our SNPs, right, we have an observed allele frequency trajectory. So here I'm showing you the observed allele frequency trajectory for the um, example SNP in blue. Um, and we can generate an expected allele frequency trajectory. So I'm showing the expected allele frequency trajectory from our gene dropping simulations in black. Um, the gray bars indicate the 95% confidence interval. So for this particular SNP, you can see that the gene dropping simulations actually track the observed change in allele frequencies, uh, allele frequency over time quite well. Um, so we went back uh, and actually looked at the allele frequency of incoming immigrants at this particular SNP. And we saw that the allele frequency of incoming immigrants is significantly increasing over time. And it's likely kind of gene flow that's driving this observed like dramatic increase in allele frequencies. Um, so this example, I'm showing this example mostly to illustrate um, that it's really important to know the underlying demography of your population. Um, as large allele frequency shifts that ordinarily may be attributed to selection could actually be due to processes such as drift and gene flow. Yes, Deepa. Okay, so this is super scary for, for people like <laughs> me, for example, who have no pedigree to fall back upon and, and do like nice simulations. Um, how much do these um, sort of actual, um, I guess, accounted, everything accounted for simulations differ from, from what would be reasonable null models that people might construct in the absence of a pedigree, right? For a similar kind of population, um, I guess, is there any sense of that? So to say, how far off could we be if we didn't have these demographic details, uh, which we will not realistically have for 99% of the populations we would work with? So how sure should I be that whatever I, I pick up as giant allele frequency changes are total bunk and completely aligned with neutrality? <laughs> Um, that's a good question. You know, I, 
feel like we should actually try to do this and we haven't directly tested it, right? So a couple things to keep in mind. One is um, the time scale you're interested in plays in an important role, right? So there's a bunch of methods for inferring population demography and rates of gene flow. I think that will work perfectly well, especially for deeper time scales. Um, we're working on like super short recent time scales. Um, I think uh, we haven't actually tested. So that's like one question I've had for a while, which is like, how different is this gene dropping based neutral model from kind of your typical right Fisher, you know, neutral model. Um, and the problem is, is that it's hard for us to actually figure out, um, to draw a good comparison. I was thinking about this and trying to be like, okay, so if we were to do right Fisher, like use a right Fisher based model, how would we do that for our population? And it gets super tricky um, because our population violates so many different assumptions, right? So we have overlapping generations, we have related individuals in every generation. Um, we also, I think the trickiest, uh, the biggest problem for us at least is um, we have kind of barely, you know, non-trivial rates of gene flow coming into our popul uh, population. We know who the immigrants are, but we have no idea where they're coming from. So we don't know how many source populations these immigrants are coming from, um, which makes it hard for us to, so then like, it makes it hard for us to know, like if there's a large difference between kind of the more traditional right Fisher model that we build mm. versus our gene dropping mm. model, we don't know what's causing it, right? Like, is it the overlapping generations? Is it the um, relatedness? Or is it the fact that we just got the number of source populations wrong? Right, right. That oh, makes um, sense. I guess I'm just curious. So for example, in terms of the time scale, I think this would be so useful for experimental evolution kinds of studies, right? Where yeah. there would be shorter time scales people are looking at and population sizes often will also be not terribly different from what, what you guys have. Um, of course, the system will be different and so on. But I mean, I feel like there's still value to having the kind of data that you have, which is incredible. Um, to, to be able to ask, you know, get some estimate of how far off are we when we use simpler models, um, just because we don't have information. Um, so I, are you aware of anybody else doing some such comparison with other kinds of pedigrees where maybe uh, gene flow is not such a big problem, for instance, at least that can be ruled out? Um, there are folks doing gene dropping simulations basically as a neutral model to in their test of selection with a soy sheep uh -huh. uh, population. And that's actually one population where I feel like we might be able to test. Mm -hmm. um, I answer your question because it, it's an island. Right. <laughs> so right. there aren't sheep swimming on and off the island, um, which makes it a little bit more convenient. Uh, it's an idea I've talked to the Soe Sheep Project about doing, um, but we haven't gotten to it yet. Um, I agree that kind of there are a lot of parallels between this work and like experimental evolution studies. I guess the nice thing about experimental evolution studies is like it's so controlled, right? So you know a lot more about like aren't your you know a lot more about the underlying demography than I think most folks working in natural populations. Yeah, yeah. I mean, some aspects of demography, yes. But again, depending on the system we're working with, like for flies or any insect or anything, which is typically used for these kinds of studies, there would be no hope of you having any idea of, for example, who made it with who and, yeah. you know, I mean, exactly how long they lived and exactly how many offspring they left behind and so on. So all of those would have to be assumptions to, to, to fit any kind of, you know, model to say, are, are we, is, is this particular allele doing better than expected or not? And so on. So anyway, I was just curious if there's information of that sort to be had. Thanks. Yeah. It's something that we've thought about doing for a long time and just haven't gotten to. Like, it's like a less fun project. I think it's probably why we haven't done it yet. <laughs> yeah. Terribly useful though. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, maybe, yeah.
I'll see if I can convince someone to work on this sooner rather than later. <laughs> um, right, so uh, I just showed you, right, that our gene dropping simulations can kind of do a good job of um, quantifying kind of the importance of drift and gene flow in our population over time. So now that we know that we have a good neutral model, do we actually see any evidence for selection? Um, so to do this, uh, we use the same approach, right? So we have these gene dropping simulations. These simulations essentially generate an expected distribution of how much allele frequency change we might expect to see in our population. Um, so here I'm showing you kind of the gray like distribution of expected allele frequency changes for a given SNP um, in our population. Here I'm looking at uh, the time period between 1999 and 2013. Um, we can then compare this uh, expected distribution to the actual observed allele frequency change, which I'm showing here in blue, um, and then calculate an empirical p-value by counting the number of simulations where the frequency change is more different from the median um, compared to the observed change. Um, so here, this is an actual SNP, data for an actual SNP. You can see on the right, the allele frequency trajectory, the observed allele frequency trajectory over time in blue, and then the gene dropping simulations in gray and black. So using this approach, uh, we found 18 SNPs across our genome uh, with significant changes in allele frequency between 1999 and 2013. Um, I will say one caveat is like we use a fairly high, we use an FDR of 0.25, um, which is very high, but it does mean that like, you know, there are still some actual SNPs um, here that are, uh, do show evidence of selection, um, but we don't know which of the 18 SNPs those are. So um, I'm not going to say very much more beyond the fact that there is some evidence for kind of selection causing kind of short term. Um, change in our population. So taking a step back, uh, we wanted to see if we can quantify the relative importance of different evolutionary processes in shaping allele frequencies genome-wide across the genome. So if you kind of think about this problem, right, to measure the change in the allele frequencies between two years, Ideally, what you need to know is the number of individuals in our population at each time point, um, N, and also the genotypes of all of these individuals, uh, which can give us the allele frequency P. So we, because we have really detailed population monitoring, we know N, so we know the number of individuals in our population over time, and we have genotyped almost all of them, so we can estimate allele frequency. Uh, the allele frequency from year to year. Um, we based our model kind of by grouping individuals into three different categories. So in any given year, um, some of the individuals in our population will be individuals who were present the year before and survived to the current year. Um, their contribution to the change in allele frequencies over time is a function of the proportion of individuals in year T who are survivors and the difference in allele frequencies between this group of survivors and the entire population in the previous year. Other individuals will be new incoming immigrants, so new individuals who showed up in our population that year. Their contribution to allele frequency change is similar. So again, it's proportion of individuals who are immigrants and times the difference in allele frequencies between this group of immigrants and the po entire population of the year before. And finally, the remaining individuals will be nestlings who are born to the survivors and immigrants um, in that year. So using this model, um, plus we um, had to kind of estimate error in order to account for individuals who actually didn't genotype. Um, but using this basic model, um, we can kind of quantify the proportion of allele frequency change genome-wide due to these three processes. So we kind of estimate, uh, calculate these terms for every SNP and then take the average um, for all SNPs across the genome. 
So on the bottom here, I'm showing you uh, the variance due to survival in red, um, the variance due to births in orange, um, the covariance between births and survival in yellow, and the blue colors indicate kind of the proportion of variance due to gene flow. Um, this proportion varies a little, so we can do the same math for like every kind of every year. Um, this proportion varies a little bit from year to year, which is what we expect. Overall, about 90% of the variance in allele frequencies we see in our population from year to year is due to variation in survival and reproduction. Right? This graph is largely red and orange. Um, variation, so this kind of the way we're modeling this based on kind of individual survival and reproduction. Um, these terms encompass both uh, drift and selection. So to, to try to disentangle the two, we did some additional simulations on our pedigree um, that show that actually drift here is the predominant force driving allele frequency change over time, um, which is consistent given our small population size. You'll notice here that the contribution of immigrants seems relatively low, especially since earlier I showed you that kind of incoming immigrants are contributing 75% of the variation in the birth cohort in 2013. Um, that's because we're the, there's differences in these two models. So one in this particular model, um, we're only considering the contributions of new immigrants the year they appeared. Uh, whereas our estimates of the expected genetic contributions of immigrants that I showed earlier kind of is including, is counting um, the contributions of immigrants and all of their descendants to the population over time. So if variation in fitness is heritable, um, then the effects of drift can be compounded over the generations. Um, so what we did was we simulated allele frequency change on randomized pedigrees where for every given year, we just like swap randomized the parent and offspring uh, assignments. Um, and if you then run the simulations on these randomized pedigrees, because um, that breaks up the heritable, heritable variation in reproductive success, we found essentially like the same patterns, which means that heritable variation in reproductive success in our population at least has no detectable effect on the variance in allele frequency change. It's also fun to see that our model reflects patterns that we observe in the field. So, well, at least for extreme events. For example, 2012 was like an especially bad year in our population. I think it was just very cold in a lot of our um, breeding adults, like this thing the father trying to reproduce. Um, we had the smallest birth cohort that we have observed in decades. Um, and from our model, you can actually see that in this particular year, survivals have a disproportionately high impact um, on allele frequency variation in that year. We can use the same approach to construct a model for um, Z, the Z chromosome loci. Um, the model has to be tweaked a little bit uh, because of the different transmission of Z chromosomes. Um, and we can also extend the model, right? Because everything is based on um, individual accounts and genotypes. Um, we can kind of split all of our terms to model males and females separately. So essentially, if we just like, uh, increase the number of terms in our model. We can model kind of contributions of males and females on, for both autosomal and Z-link variation separately. Um, and we did this to try to assess the contribution of both sex-biased demography and sex-biased inheritance on short-term allele frequency change. Um, so here I'm showing you the proportion of variance in the allele frequency change for autosomes on top and the Z chromosomes on the bottom. Um, Instead of breaking things down by process, I'm breaking, I'm showing you the variance contributed by different like males versus females. So purple is um, variance in allele frequency change caused by covariances between females and males. Pink is the variance to the females and blue is the variance to the males. Um, 
So here you can see from the top graph that females and males for the most part contribute equally to autosomal allele frequency change. Um, and if you compare that to the bottom, females contribute a lot less uh, to the variance in allele frequency change on the Z, which is kind of what you expect, but it's kind of fun um, to be able to show this result. Um, so to summarize this first part, um, hopefully I've convinced you that if you have the ability to um, construct population pedigrees, there's a lot of fun things you can learn about short-term evolutionary processes. So for instance, we can use these pedigrees to estimate individual, expected individual genetic contributions over time, um, which can help you predict allele frequencies and in our case, quantify the really high contribution of um, gene flow. When looking at kind of individual SNPs, we found that gene flow can drive some allele frequency trajectories, but there is some evidence of rapid evolution of genotypes due to selection. Um, Genome-wide, however, the variance in allele frequency change from year to year is primarily due to drift. Um, and we can see kind of expected contributions in females and males for autosomes and Z kind of reflect our expectations based on the kind of numbers of chromosome numbers and also the inheritance patterns of autosomes and Zs uh, in the two sexes. Any questions before I move on to like a different story? Any questions about what I just talked about? Um, if not, I'll move on. So everything I just talked about was looking at changes from year to year, essentially. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is that selection is actually this really complex process, um, and it can act at different stages of the life cycle within a single generation. Right, so here I'm showing you the life cycle diagram for a typical sexually reproducing organism. Um, selection can influence the survival of zygotes to adults, uh, which is called viability selection. Not all adults actually um, successfully reproduce, so there are opportunities for sexual selection. Um, even among individuals who are reproducing, there might be a lot of you know, genetic variation for um, in clutch size or kind of egg number. Um, so there are opportunities for fecundity selection. Um, and then finally, there may be kind of differential transmission of gametes or gametic selection. So Tim Prout in um, the 60s was the first to point out that, you know, traditional estimates of selection that are looking at allele frequency changes from year to year or generation to generation um, actually confound these four different selection components. And so rigorous, like very rigorous inference of selection really ought to be testing for selection at these different life cycle stages. Um, and Christensen and Frydenberg in the 70s came up with this really elegant hierarchical um, statistical framework uh, for testing for selection at um, independent life cycle stages. So their framework is called selection component analysis. It was originally developed um, for random mother offspring pairs sampled from a population. Um, and what we've done is basically take that basic idea, but change the, um, for the most part, change the actual models we're using to test for selection mainly because in our population, we know, we have way more information because we can sample entire families, right? We know who we have mom, we know who mom is, we know who dad is, and we um, oftentimes know who all of their offspring are and have genotypes for everybody. Um, so I thought I would show you kind of some results that we've found so far. Let's start with gametic selection. So here the um, question we're asking is whether or not heterozygote individuals transmit both alleles equally frequently to all of their offspring. Um, so for example, in this family, if dad is a heterozygote, um, does he produce an equal frequency of heterozygote and homozygote offspring? 
To do this, we developed a full likelihood approach where we kind of combed through our data set and identified all of the trios where at least one parent is a heterozygote at a given SNP. Um, and we counted up the number of kids with each genotype uh, for these different kind of parental genotype combinations. And so using these numbers and kind of like the binomial model, um, we can estimate the probability that the male transmits um, a given allele and the probability the female transmits a given allele. Um, and then we can use a likelihood ratio test to ask whether or not this probability is significantly different from 0.5, which is the null um, expectation. Um, so on the bottom here, I'm showing you a Manhattan plot. So I'm showing the minus log 10 p values for all of our SNPs on the y-axis arrayed across um, with genomic position arrayed on the x-axis. Um, so after multiple testing correction, there were three uh, SNPs that showed interest, but one of them, um, when we dug deeper, it's, it was like the sample sizes were so small that we don't really believe it. It's like, um, so really what we do is we have two potential gametic selection hits, um, one on the on chromosome 10 and one on an unmapped scaffold. Uh, here I'm showing the um, kind of transmission probabilities for males on the y-axis and females on the x-axis. Um, so one of the SNPs, like the male, we, expect the male, the male transmission probability is estimated to be around 0.6. What's remarkable is that for this other SNP, there's like super high segregation distortion where males are um, transmitting, estimated to transmit this allele 90% of the time. Um, so it's fairly strong the media selection. We are still kind of looking up, um, like working on completing annotation of the genome. Um, so I can't really tell you if there's interesting genes around these hits just yet. So for the other three components, viability selection, sexual selection, and fecundity selection, we use the same approach. Um, so I'll introduce them together. So here we essentially used a genome-wide association study um, to identify SNPs that might be associated with survival, breeding status, or clutch size. Um, so the way we do did this was to fit mixed models with uh, the, our phenotype of interest. Um, we included the kinship matrix, na uh, the natal year, and natal nest of individuals as random effects. Um, we, before we could start looking for the effects of each SNP, we first had to perform a variable selection step um, because we have a ton of potential fixed effects um, that we needed to consider. It was like the beauty and curse of having a lot of data is then we have this like complicated process of trying to figure out which of these variables actually matter. Um, so essentially there were a number of different potential fixed effects that we considered things that were attributes of the individual such as age, kind of catch date, how, how big they were, immigrant status, et cetera. Um, there were attributes of the natal nest um, that we considered. So like number of helpers, how large that natal nest was, um, the age and experience of the parents. And then finally, uh, variables that change from year to year, such as population density, rainfall, um, temperature, acorn abundance, et cetera. So once we identified kind of these non-genetic uh, factors that were important for our phenotype of interest, uh, we then fit the um, SNP genotype for every SNP to test for significant associations. We modeled uh, females and males separately. Um, and for viability selection, at least, we found some interesting potential hits for females. Um, so for viability selection, what we were doing was we were looking at survival um, across different stages of um, the life. So we banned our individuals uh, when they're 11 days old. So that's when we can start our analyses. Um, Florida scrub jays stay in the nest until around day 18. That's when they leave, fledge the nest. Um, 
Day 30 is when they stop pretending to be pine cones and are a little bit more mobile, um, are flying around a little bit more. Um, by around day 90, individuals are nutritionally independent from their parents. By around day 300, they're physiologically capable of breeding, um, although in many cases, individuals don't actually become a breeder um, until much later. And then we also ask whether or not they uh, successfully managed to establish as a breeder. Um, so for females, we found some interesting results if we look at survival between day 30 to day 300. Um, the kind of other fixed effects that we considered in this model include rainfall um, during their natal year, um, their inbreeding coefficient, and also territory size. Um, so if we control for these factors, we found one particular SNP on chromosome 21 that appears to have a large effect on female survival. Um, so the plot on the bottom right, I'm showing you um, the survival probability for females um, of different genotypes at this particular SNP. And you can see that the alternate homozygotes have a difference in survival probabilities of like 0.3, which is huge. Um, so clearly there is a genetic component to survival for females in our population. It's weird to find a large effect allele um, because we uh, did this analysis expecting to find nothing um, because you would expect, you know, a trait like polygenic or a trait like survival to be highly polygenic, polygenic with lots of alleles of small effect. And yet we found this weird large effect allele. Um, so we're digging into it a little bit more. Um, for Males, we didn't find any um, significant associations for survival. Um, and we also found nothing for sexual selection, which is not particularly surprising. Um, for fecundity selection, here we're modeling um, clutch size. So how many eggs are in the first clutch of a season for a given individual? Um, for, our, for females, um, we had to consider whether or not she was a new breeder, whether or not her mate was a new breeder, um, and also like hatching order and like number of immigrant parents mattered for female fecundity. Um, for male fecundity, the only important factors were whether or not his mate was a new breeder uh, and the fire history of his natal territory. Um, here, I'm once again showing two Manhattan plots. So for female fecundity on top and male fecundity on the bottom, um, we found kind of some regions associated with clutch size in both females and males. Um, and it's interesting that these regions are different. Um, so like the genetic kind of basis for fecundity for males and females is likely different in our population. So to briefly summarize kind of where we've gotten in this particular project, um, we know that selection can act at different stages of the life cycle. Um, and we've tried to do this very fine scale dissection of selection across life cycle stages. Um, so far, we've found evidence for gametic selection in males, viability selection in females, and fecundity selection in males and females. Um, and one of the goals of this analysis, right, is um, I guess twofold. So, one, in theory, if you can estimate selection coefficients for all of your SNPs, um, at these four different life cycle stages, you should be able to um, combine them somehow to predict, to actually then predict allele frequency change in our population um, from year to year. We have looked to see whether or not these SNPs um, that are these, uh, the SNPs that we identified in this analysis, whether or not they're associated, because we have like, um, allele frequency trajectories, right, for all of our SNPs. And we look to see whether or not these SNPs are increasing or decreasing significantly in our population over time, and they aren't. Um, and that can be um, because of a couple things. There could be kind of trade-offs among different um, selection components, or there could be kind of antagonism between males and females, right, that's acting to maintain variation for these fitness components. Um, we are still kind of thinking through analyses, but one thing we have looked at is to look at the correlations of effect sizes for all of the SNPs in our analysis. 
Um, so here I'm showing you kind of um, the, we tried many different tests, right? So I tried, I'm showing you kind of the different survival analyses for males and females, um, our sexual selection analysis. We kind of ended up measuring fecundity in a number of different ways. So like whether or not an individual had any eggs, the actual egg number, or like the egg number, um, assuming it was non-zero, um, and also gametic selection. Red shows kind of positive correlations and effect sizes for all of the SNPs across the genome between these different components, and blue shows uh, negative correlations. So for the most part, um, effect sizes in males and females are positively correlated with each other. So there's not kind of evidence of widespread sexual antagonism across the genome here. Um, and in the box, I'm show, kind of highlighting the survival versus fecundity um, uh, tests. And there is some evidence for a trade-off, your like classic you know, life history trade-off between survival and fecundity, where for some of our survival traits, um, the effect sizes are negatively correlated with kind of our measure of fecundity. So that's kind of fun. All right, um, to wrap up, uh, what I've talked to you about today um, are kind of two, I guess, like three different big projects. Um, and I've shown you that gene dropping is a very powerful way of modeling neutral processes and populations with known pedigrees and for estimating individual genetic contributions. One of the things we're doing right now is kind of um, whole genome resequencing of a lot of our individuals coupled with genotype imputation. So then we can get dense kind of genotype data for all of the individuals in our pedigree over time. So we can then actually track the inheritance of haplotypes down the pedigree and calculate realized genetic contributions um, over time. In our population, we found that gene flow is a very important contributor to genetic variation over time. Um, but overall, still most allele frequency change from year to year uh, is due to genetic drift, which is not that surprising. And then finally, um, at the end, I told you about kind of this large project on selection component analysis, trying to look at kind of um, the genomics of selection on different like history stages and then combining that information um, to look for evidence of trade offs and try to learn more about the maintenance of genetic variation in natural populations. And I've hoped, you know, that I've convinced you that using pedigree information and population genetic inference, if you can, is a very powerful way of modeling contemporary evolution in natural populations. And this ability, right, to estimate individual genetic contributions to future generations and trace the inheritance of genomes down the pedigree provides a very precise estimate of the evolutionary processes governing the real frequency change. All right, so none of the work I do would be possible without the huge crew of interns and staff who collect field data at Archibald Biological Station each year. Um, it's been a lot of fun working with this great team. Um, I also have a wonderful team of collaborators and students um, and many folks who've helped me along the way. I'd also like to thank my funding sources and thank you uh, for listening and I'd be happy to take any additional questions. Uh, I had a question. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Maybe I missed uh, missed this. But uh, in when you talked about the selection uh, and trying to identify SNPs which are influencing different types of selection, uh, how do you account? Uh, how do you decide which um, environmental factors are to be controlled for? Like you showed that different factors were controlled for in different situations. So how is that decided? Um, that's a great question and something we actually wrestled with for a long time. Um, so we ended up doing this kind of complicated variable selection approach where uh, we threw in the, um, sorry, I'm trying to remember what we ended up doing because we tried like a bunch of different approaches. But the basic idea here is that we first uh, fit models with those different environmental effects um, and then kept the variables that were significant um, in those models. 
And then we created new models using those significant environmental effects plus the SNP genotype, and that's how we did the GWAS. Okay, yeah, thank you. Any other questions? All right. Okay, I guess we're at the end. Um, thank you very much, Nancy. That was really exciting, um, exciting work and, and a great resource, I think, for, for understanding how populations evolve when we have so much more data. <laughs> so, um, thank yeah, you. thank you very much for your, for your lectures. It was very useful. Thank you, Nancy. Take care. Yes. Bye. Thank you all. Take care. Have a good night.